On this episode, I have a conversation with acclaimed portrait photographer, Jake Hicks. Unlike many other photographers, Jake shies away from what has become the norm, opting for vibrant colors in his work that stands out. Jake was suggested to me by a member of the community, so I decided to reach out to him. If you have any suggestions for who you would like me to reach out, head over to thephotographyjunkie.com drop me a message and I will take a look at their work. If you enjoy this conversation, don't forget to like and subscribe for more each week where I bring you interviews every other week with somebody that I find interesting and inspiring. Anyway, it's time to get on with the conversation. This is The Photography Junkie. Hello everyone and welcome to The Photography Junkie. I'm your host Jay and in this episode, it's episode 22 and I have a bit of a treat for you. As I quite often do, I post out into the community to ask who you are finding inspiring and I reach out to them for you so that I can learn about them with you. Uh, This is another one of those episodes and the person I've reached out to this week struck me as someone who does not shy away from the use of strong colours in their work. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you, Jake Hicks. Hi, Jake. How you doing? Thanks for having me on. No problem at all. Um, So as I said, uh, I reach out to people when when they uh, request it and basically somebody on the website Purpleport suggested yourself. And so I checked out your work and really enjoyed your colour work uh, that you've uh, put up. So I thought I'd uh, get you on the show. Thank you, yeah. Purple Port is a blast from the past. Yeah, I don't think I've updated my images on there in whew, many years. So yeah, I'll have to actually have a look at that. Yeah. But yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And um, thank you to whoever, you know, put my name to the top of the list. Um. So uh, can you tell me about your journey as a freelance photographer over the past decade um what inspired you to take that career path yeah it's i mean i suppose the journey of any creative is far from simple but um yeah i mean i've been doing this for about 20 years i did i did i'm one of the rare idiots that actually studied the thing that i ended up doing uh but yeah so yeah i've been doing it for a long time i went freelance when i left art college back in back in 2000 i suppose 2001 something like that and then uh did that for a few years this is like the this is just before pre pre-digital so we so we were shooting film back then we were doing weddings and corporate headshots and hair shoots and charity events and really just really just anything that needed a camera right is what, what i would refer to as like a postcode shooter so back then it was just like have camera will will shoot you know um so I did that for a little bit and then digital age kicked off and the kind of world of photography was, was sorting itself out. It was like every, every mother's brother's dog's neighbor was, was buying a professional camera and could obviously thus take professional images. Uh, so it was kind of a weird one work wise at the time. It was, you know, people didn't, people didn't really need a professional photographer because they had this really expensive camera. Obviously, that's how it works. Um, my oven would would disagree, but the uh, you know that that was that's, that's the premise, right? You, you know, you just have this really nice camera. You can obviously take great pictures. So it was kind of difficult to uh, j- justify the same sort of costs that that we were charging years years before. And uh, I, I took I took a little bit of a break from it back then and. Uh, I did a lot of, I worked in like a climbing and outdoor shop, which was kind of crazy. So I did a lot of traveling and mountaineering and that sort of thing, which was, which was great. But, um, ultimately I am really only half good at one thing. So I did have to get back into photography at some point. Uh, I worked in a very busy studio from there and I did that. It was like a, it was like a portrait studio, but it was like a salary job with regard, you know, so you just turn up, uh, you know, on Monday, Jake, you're in studio one photograph in this you know tuesday jake you're in studio two photograph in this yada, yada, yada. but very 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 busy studio pay was horrendous um and working in a studio is is a phenomenal opportunity to learn a huge amount right i mean in my opinion there's no real shortcut to 
getting better other than to actually shoot right you know i know we're in a very privileged position right now where everybody and their grandmother is on youtube like telling you how to do things and that sort of stuff but there is no real substitute for actually you know picking up the camera and actually spending hours behind the lens um and working in a studio like that whether it regardless of what you're shooting you know is is going to be the best best way to uh just get get better and more importantly you know work out what you like what you don't like as well and that's kind of what i was doing there for several years and that's where my sort of passion for the color work came from it was just we would be asked to do boring white background high key stuff and just day in day out that's what people were asking for i mean like because the studio was busy we didn't but we like it was you know you're kind of a victim of your own success in that sense and i'm talking about 2007 2008 sort of time i suppose so like real like studio was crazy busy so you didn't really need to be too interesting or engaging like the, like the work was coming in um but it was soul destroying just to do the same thing over and over again so as it was uh, my sort of dive into the color work was me fighting against please no more gap advert style shot please you know you remember the gap adverts from the 90s it's just pure white background it's just that, that's all that's all people wanted so the color work was was, was me fight, fighting against that to a certain extent and that just grew and grew and grew um i got better at it over time and then you know it grew from there that people started to actually ask for it you know and um yeah so then i then i quit the um, studio went freelance again and yeah here we are here we are yeah and as uh, somebody that actually went through a, a formal education system to, to learn this, at yeah. what point do you think that it was either justified or wasted, considering how the uh, the world has become in the realms of sort of YouTube teaching everybody how to do it? Yeah, that's a great question. And I wish that more people would ask that because I think that like we're kind of split, right? We have this whole generation of people who... Like practically on the on the front page of their website go i'm self-taught okay <laughs> like my dentist thankfully doesn't promote that right like i don't i don't know where that comes from um like it's weird that that's a badge of honor like yeah against all the odds i managed to learn something like it's cool that, that, that you teach yourself and we're all learning all the time and that's that's an amazing opportunity that we have but at the same time i do think there is a huge amount of benefit from learning from people who have been there before you and who are going to maybe point you in the right direction one of the one of the hardest things that i think younger people at the moment can struggle with it is like what do i what do i focus on right i can i can learn anything i want like literally within minutes i can find you know hdr landscapes i can find long exposure light painting i can you know i, I can just learn like drone i just learn whatever i want instantly so i think people can kind of start flitting about a little bit and and sort of lacking a little bit of focus with regards to seeing significant it, improvements and look that's absolutely fine like everybody's got their own goal right i just want to pick up i just I bought this really nice camera i just want to take some cool pictures and i want to feel good about taking good pictures nothing wrong with that at all um but i do think that there is a like that like the ceiling that you can get with that is um is lower than we than we think uh again because we're not too focused the one thing that that i love and hate about formal education and look formal education can be finding a mentor online right so it's not you don't have to spend like 10 10 000 quid to go through uni um but the formal education like like that just has some 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 grounding in reliability it's not like anybody in this country can be an accountant right as terrifying as that is other countries you need you need some sort of proof but in this country no jeff down the pub can sort sort out your accounts so um going going to university means that you've got somebody who's qualified and really should 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 be there in, in a position to teach you and what they are going to teach you is they're going to teach you stuff that you don't want to know right that seems like what well, why would i do that but the benefit of that is that somebody can teach you stuff that you that you don't know what you don't know as well, right? So at the moment, I can search for this thing, but that's really only I'm, I'm only looking for one specific thing, and I'm really just being monkey see. The uh, Dunning Kruger effect. 
I, I'm, I'm not sure what, what what that is. What does that mean? Uh, so Dunning Kruger effect is uh, literally you don't know what you don't know. So okay, okay. You, your confidence level as a as a learner is high, and you think you're really good, and then you learn a bit and discover that you're not actually that good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and and, and that's right, right? Because I think there there was a lot of really strong foundational learning that that I learned going through formal education that I still use today like like you know teaching you how to read the light what are we trying to achieve with this light why are we putting that light there what are we doing with this like you know what is what is depth to us like how does that how do we as consumers react to imagery um you know and even even before i i, I did that i actually did a um foundational art course where i did like ceramics graphic design fine art with regards to like oils and like you know life drawing with you know charcoal like all that sort of stuff in in terms of visual like i use some of the stuff that, that i learned doing that doing you know like life drawing because you are you are, you are you only read the light when you're life drawing right that that is and i use that way of seeing light the way i was taught to see light and the way i was taught to transfer that light from in front of me to my medium um you know you're being taught to do that and that's not like nobody's searching for that on youtube right it's just like that's that's not cool um but it's foundational learning like that that i think is uh, really really important and stuff and you know gave gave me a really strong um grounding for you know where i where i went how i found my style how i found what i was enjoying how i how i was able to you know target what i was enjoying and looking to recreate that why i was trying to recreate that that sort of thing so i think for me yes like um like i i got whatever it is a two one i never went to the graduation I, I i don't even know where the piece of paper is like i'm not i'm not there for that i'm not there to put it on my on my wall and go yay i've got this thing signed that's not that's not what i'm saying is is a benefit because nobody's going to ask you for that shit but it, what is important is is you being taught how to learn to a certain extent how to how to have that foundational knowledge so yes i think it's a great question and, and i do think that for me personally it was certainly extremely definitely worth it absolutely yeah and do you do you consider consider yourself um lucky almost in being one of the very very few people that managed to land on your direction early that's fair i guess yeah i mean you could say that i failed absolutely everything else um that is that is one way to look at it uh because that is what happened <laughs> I didn't have any any grades or, or anything like that 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 meant that um, I could you know I could go off and you know be a structural engineer or anything like that. So I was kind of fell into it to a certain extent, um, and and that's that's one of the benefits of doing kind of like that foundational art course was doing i did you know like i said ceramics graphic design fine art and, and photography was one of those um strings to that and yeah it was in there for you know very 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 fortunate with the tutor that i had where you know he was somebody that tried to eke out what he could see that you were you know you were kind of going going into i'm i'm somebody that can only work on a project for a very limited amount of time and then i'm on to the next thing you know so like he so so he was like very very free with it we were you know in the dark room with enlargers and pouring sand on the paper and like suspending the enlargers to the scene like getting like getting our hands dirty with photography rather than this okay let's get the tape measure out and measure the tripod at six and a half feet from the nose of the subject like it was none of that you know because that's that's not that's not art to me so yeah i was i was certainly very fortunate fortunate to find a tutor like that who was able to kind of coax that out of me so yeah like certainly very fortunate yeah so the um on a sort of previous uh, interview i actually interviewed a, a university lecturer that teaches media studies okay um and we broached a similar similar uh, sort of path in terms of the, uh, the the sort of thought process behind the the YouTube learning versus university. And one of the uh, points that he brought up is the when you go through that uh, formal education process, one of the side effects is contacts and people that you can then sort of reach out to after the fact. Have you found that to be a, a similar situation for yourself? I could definitely see that in other industries. I think that 
the photographic industry is almost indistinguishable from what it was 20 years ago. Um, now, obviously, I, I haven't gone through the process of doing it with um, something else, but um, I'm, I, I'm I'm guessing like the like the art world maybe has has changed less, but our our industry has changed so dramatically. I mean, you know. 20 years ago I was assisting in London doing the doing all the all the, the regular things that that we would do but back then with film and like technology has just so dramatically changed our our industry that um I did not find any benefit in any of the contacts really like other than hanging out with other photographers who we would bounce ideas off but they were at my level so no I, I personally didn't 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 find any um, any benefit in, in 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 those contacts, really. No. And uh, you trained a lot on on film, sort of coming into the industry. Do you ever sort of go back on and pick up a film camera every so often, or? I do. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I think that that is that is foundational knowledge that that is not being taught today and i know it's really difficult to kind of justify it today it's like why would i learn there's no point in learning that jake like nobody uses that you know um it's uh that, that would be wasted time to a certain extent but i think i was one of the last one of the last kind of years where we were being taught that pretty much full time like we just like there was not a digital camera you know in our in our college, even though the one of the reasons I did the course was because it was uh, photography and digital imaging was was the course title, and like we had like a couple of Macs and a and, and an Epson scanner, like that was the extent of the digital imaging side of it. Um, so they were so 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 they were uh, definitely forward thinking in terms of the uh, course description, but not in terms of the content. But in like as as it turned out, I I feel very fortunate that, that I was trained in that way. Um, people go, oh, you know, like you 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 know, your ability with color and that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, you, you seem to find, you know, color theory and stuff very simple and very, yeah. Have you tried color printing? Like, it's really like, difficult. <laughs> like, color printing is so difficult um, and time consuming, you know. So, like, you really got to get your eye, you know, dialed in. And that's kind of training you to see colors in a very different way to, you know, to the way that we would do now. Um, you know, even being taught black and white, like you're, like you're seen to, like, you, you are taught to see light contrast, which, again, like, it's not something that we, that we do now as much, you know, like the checkerboard or, Chiriscour and all that sort of stuff it is is foundational knowledge that I think is uh, that I'm super grateful that I've got and and still still use I have or I'm, and I, I'm very fortunate but I I am able to render fairly accurate 3D lighting models in my head and kind of walk around them spatially to have a very strong understanding of of how the light is going to look even before i step foot in the studio now i appreciate that that's that's not something that that um everybody can do but i do think that a lot of that ability came from being being taught as to this is what this light does this is why it does this because of its size its modifier its distance and all this sort of stuff you're basically learning this language um that you're then that you can then apply that that code if you like to everything else moving forward and do you have a, a favorite film stock that you go to a favorite film oh stock i thought you said like what's your favorite f, f number i was like wow that's <laughs> personal <laughs> um no i don't know so so that is yeah so that is a something that, that i i sort of straddle this line between being a a, a heathen with regards to i shoot um i got the you see up there on the shelf but i got i shoot the um pentax six seven and i mean i just i just buy whatever whatever film's cheap if i'm being totally honest which i know is um heresy but <laughs> um mainly because i'm scanning it right so i'm just getting the i'm getting the image and then i'm scanning it in and then i'm, I'm doing i'm doing my color grades that, that i would normally do to my um digital files anyway so i'm yes i shoot film but i shoot film for the for the beautiful depth and the size of the uh, film plane that it's very difficult to achieve even even today without spending a ludicrous amount of money like the six by seven film plane is just i mean the thing's damn near a postcard the thing is absolutely monstrous and that depth of field and 
it's just scale that you get on like a headshot portrait or something like that is just still unmatched is it's just unrivaled yeah i have a, I have a mia uh, yeah. rv67 oh there you go but beautiful exactly that's it i mean that's i mean that thing is just a dream the, th- the shots like like a headshot of, of of that is just i mean you like it's you you, like, you can't beat it. I mean, that's going back to like the like the Vogues and of, of, of the 90s and that sort of stuff where it, it's just incredible, incredible images. You know, especially for somebody like me who, who's, who sort of loves the editorial style, which is a little bit rawer, it, 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 beautiful look. You know, and I, I if if I could get a digital camera that was that had that size film plane and was like eight, eight megapixels, I'd buy it tomorrow. I don't really give two shits about the megapixels. It's it's just not not that relevant in today's well, viewing, market viewing yeah. distance is the thing that makes the difference for the exactly. megapixels isn't yeah. it so yeah 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 so um but yeah that depth is you know it's just gorgeous yeah absolutely gorgeous yeah uh one one film stock i could probably recommend for your just sort of crazy colors yeah uh, it's got to be ector kodak ector <laughs> yeah okay okay yeah terrible I, I, on, I, on natural color skin Oh really? Okay. <laughs> Great if you're using colours. What was that originally designed for then? Uh, I think it was designed for like cars and and sort of oh, okay. advertising. Okay. Maybe a little bit colder but it's than terrible yeah. on, on skin tones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because uh, obviously, like the with colours and everything, portrait, it right. really sort of is really, really vibrant. Uh, really vibrant. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's definitely definitely worth uh, getting a, a throwaway roll for just to try it. Yeah, I mean, I've got a couple of rolls of the Cine Still stuff that, that everybody, you know, is raving about, but um, I, I just haven't, haven't had the nerve to actually use it yet. Yeah, that's, that's, that's you know, if if it's a foggy night and a petrol station, you know, everybody just grabs their Cine Still and you know they're out there. Yeah. Although on the uh, on the RB, my probably my favourite thing to shoot on it is Polaroid or the um, uh, the Fuji film. Yeah, the uh, FP 100C yeah. thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it costs an arm and a leg now. It's like 60 quid a box or something like that. But yes, so I use um, a Mamiya Universal Press for that. And it's got a Polaroid back, which is like, I mean, and it, and it works really well. I, you know, like the rangefinder is a little bit hit and miss, but, you know, um, you know, for portraits and that sort of thing. But in, in terms of the peel apart, it's just gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, I do have, I still have a couple of, a couple of boxes up there that I just waiting for something to justify using six quid a shot or whatever it is yeah yeah it's it's, it's a pricey game but i do at least go back to it at least once a year yeah I, I, polaroid and, and the instant stuff keeps keeps trying to uh, rear its head right impossible project keep keep trying to do something with it uh, it's a very different look in terms of their instant film, you know. But it's great that they're doing it. I mean, Polaroid just brought out what literally last week, like the Polaroid 2.0 thing, you know, with their with their new camera, which is supposedly you know bragging about the lens and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, it still looks like still looks six hundred six hundred pounds for a Polaroid camera, though. It is, isn't it? That's right. I was, I was thinking, is that right? I mean, in my brain, as I was saying, I was like, it can't be that much. But yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's got the a images digital like display just... on it and everything. You can choose your aperture. That's right. And... Yeah, manual, which is which is great. Um, but the images still look like it was taken on the, you know, like the fifteen quid camera that you can get on eBay. You know, because it's because it's the film that gives it that look. It's not it's not the lens. You know. And do you ever sort of uh, sort of replicate that sort of filmic look digitally? yeah that's that yeah that's that's another good question that i think we're seeing like we're kind of seeing more of that now um you know it's kind of kind of coming back uh and i'm seeing even more of that especially with ai people kind of bouncing off the the very clinical um ai look and you know look i'm not i'm not shy about uh saying that i'm not a huge fan of the way that some of the cameras have gone just in terms of their clinical look is it is is a bit too saccharine for me really there's nothing wrong with that and look you know yeah and and i am talking about sony here but you know if i was a still live shooter i would I, I, i would buy a sony tomorrow um I think for portraits and kind of like more of the editorial style work that I do, you know, coming, just coming a little bit back from that, you know, like, I mean, I shoot Nikon, so close enough is good enough. Um, 
you know, in, in terms of their lenses, you know, but it feels a little bit more organic, right? And I do think that we're kind of seeing a shift to that a little bit, like I said, with, with AI being so clinical with its um appearance now although that's changing as well now that now that everybody's kind of dulling dulling that that down and, and seeing that that fake look is is isn't popular but yes i certainly have added uh, noise and grain to my images in the past and i've added a little bit of hellation here and there um one of the main reasons i add the noise though is is really to prevent the social media sites from crushing the images i use a lot of color in my images which which can which can band very very quickly um whereas the noise tricks the social media compression um system so that it thinks that oh normally if it would say oh this is like these three red colors here they're kind of the same they're kind of the same red so we'll just group them together to save space um and that's where you start to see the banding right whereas where if you add a, a layer of noise on top the compression tool goes oh there's actually a ton of different colors going on here. Like we can't, we can't compress these, so they, so they kind of leave it alone. So that's kind of the, the reason why I add noise to my images is to kind of um, fight against that. Uh, but the cinematic look, you know, that that term that is used a lot now, that's cinematic look, is something that we're seeing a lot of. You know, like the lifted blacks, a lot of a lot of you know noise. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been doing it, the S curves for the past. 10 years nearly <laughs> yeah exactly i mean yeah so you know um so the s curve being a little bit more contrast right is that what you're saying um yeah. just uh just cutting out the uh, the blacks a little bit lifting them up a bit oh so you doing an oh, oh so you're doing that okay you're going that way okay which 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 i would say is where where things are going more now whereas sort of 10 years ago like the curve was the other way so pump up the highlights and really crank crank down the um, blacks and that sort of thing so i think we're going going away from that and, and again like all that kind of ties into that cinematic and that like analog you know vintage nostalgic you know all the buzzwords mm. that you can possibly think of right so um as, as somebody that um places a lot of value on color what color space are you in uh, so, I mean, that, that again goes back to my camera choice as well. Several years ago, I did a test with, you know, the Nikon versus the Canon versus the Fuji versus the Sony. And, you know, for the sort of work that I'm doing, the Nikon came out on top for the, for the sort of thing that, that, that I wanted. Um, yeah, I think if I was a wedding shooter, I would shoot Canon tomorrow. Um, like I said, if I was a still live shooter, I would go Sony, but for the sort of work that I'm doing in the studio where I can often find sort of large areas of, of, of like blank background, for example, like maybe there's a, like a, like a neutral mid gray background, like the, like the Canon would add a lot of colored noise in there. Whereas I think the Nikons do a very good job of looking at that and, and kind of sharing it out evenly. Um, I found that the sort of oranges and reds were better in the Nikon versus the Sony. Now, whether the Sony is more neutral in terms of a video world, right? Because like the log, I mean, it's just it's just nothing there. Right? It's just super super flat. So whether whether that is uh, where the Sony is coming from, looking more towards the you know video side of the market, hence why the colors don't seem as rich straight out of camera maybe um but yeah so nikon and then uh i'll be try and work in adobe 98 just to just just because like if you can get it looking good in that then it's going to look good on online you know and that's just the reality of of what we're what we're working with now is the most of our images are just being viewed viewed online you got the srgb and the pro photo rgb and all that sort of stuff but um which is a which is a larger color space but it doesn't always translate particularly well um, i i went uh srgb um in the choices for for what i do just purely because the phone that you're looking at is srgb the screen you're looking at is srgb it's a reduced color space compared to adobe but 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, guess the middle ground. Um, maybe the middle ground. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of. I, I've tried the sRGB. Um, I mean, it's been years since I've done those tests, but yeah, the Adobe ninety eight is the one that the one that I think I'm on now. Yeah, I would need to check. I was just. I've just been in the same workflow for the last decade. I, but I'm pretty sure that's what it's exported at from Lightroom. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um. On your on your site, uh, you mentioned working with varied and influential clients. Um, are you able to share any memorable experiences or projects that have helped shape your career? Yeah, that's yeah, that's um, like the clients thing is is I'm not I'm not somebody that that shouts shouts off the um, rooftops about about who I've worked with but I mean I've done movie posters and stuff in the past and work with musicians and that sort of thing which is um which is cool but I think the jobs the jobs that stood out to me are the ones where I had a bit more creative control or um jobs where I you know overcome just just everything was stacked against you you know there was a shoot where we were in a London nightclub and like everything was painted matte black and this and the ceiling was like six and a half feet high and um there was weird metal structures on all the walls that meant that the that the radio slaves weren't working and it was like this cannot get any worse you know this is like a nightmare um but the yeah, images turned out awesome you know and like like to me that's that's that, that's that's kind of what um what gives me gives me a buzz at the end of the day is really just creating something where you know really <laughs> really everybody <laughs> was trying to make it so that you couldn't create something um so so yeah i mean there's, there's there's certainly been brands over the years and that sort of thing but it's not something that 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 interests me really yeah it's it's really going to be the project how much creative control i'm i'm able to have and um you know <laughs> did, did the images look look cool at the end you know so do you think that sort of aspect of uh photography is more sort of creativity by commission what do you mean by that i uh, so like uh, a committee uh deciding on basically the direction that you should be going <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. So I do know what you mean, and I thought that's what you were alluding to. But the, it, like, like the like the buck has to stop with somebody, right? And I know you know it's popular on Instagram to go, oh, here's the amazing collaborative event, and it's just, everybody did this such an amazing job. But yeah, like somebody's got to somebody's got to you know take a little bit of control at some point and go look this is what we're aiming towards right this is what we need to achieve now i'm i'm happy to be to be pulled in one direction or another on the day right uh if if i see the the oh, the, oh i love that idea let's go in that direction like i am not somebody who who won't budge but i am somebody who goes into every photo shoot with a very clear lighting diagram of exactly where everything's going to be um of you know the styling of the colors i'm going to use of you know like the height of the lights the you know what i want the pose to look like and that sort of thing so i am somebody who who will go into a shoot with with all that signed off um so that everybody knows what they're doing right um and i know that i there's a lot of photographers out there who don't work like that it's just like oh yeah cool right you want yeah you want you want the hair to look cool yeah i can do that uh I, and that's fine like but but for me there there is just way too many variables with the type of work that, that i do you know once you've once you've got five six seven lights involved and you know three four five six colors involved um you know what is going to be you know the density is, is it going to be an afro is it going to be is it going to be platinum blonde hair is it you know is it is the corset going to be made of latex? Is it going to be made of hammered copper? Like, you know, how translucent is the, you know, sheer item? Like all these things need to need to be accounted for beforehand. And, I, and like I said, I am happy to wing it on, on the day. And if something strikes me as being interesting, um, then I think a part of our skill of being good at what we do is being able to adapt. But yes, I think that... Um, I do like to have a clear idea and as long as that's signed off by the client beforehand then that's cool. So my answer to your question is yes, I do like to take 
creative control, but that obviously has to be signed off by the client beforehand, right? Um, and it just alleviates any any issues. Plus, I will endeavor to do as much, if not everything, in camera on the day, right? Um, and that can that can help hugely. I did a sh like a perfume shoot last week, for example, where the client couldn't couldn't make it to the job. Now. The perfume shoot that he wanted was the model holding the perfume and then light painting going on in, in the shot as well, right? So long exposure, light painting. We've got a million and one variables with, with regards to how that's going to look. But if you're doing it, that, that would be easy to do that separately, right? So have the model holding the perfume bottle cool then right she leaves then we can just turn all the lights off and then just do the light painting and then we can go cool we'll just we'll just you know bring that into photoshop turn the blend mode to screen job done right so you could have done that the issue with that is that the client then has free reign to just adjust the, the ever living hell out of that after the fact mm, maybe if we just moved it a little bit here and oh it's covering the perfume bottle a bit too much there and like I, I I am not somebody who's got the patience to be to, to, to be going backwards and forwards like that. So if it's done on the day in camera, then they get sent the the raws, right? Which which is what happened. They can see exactly how it's going to look, right? This is where the light painting is. Can you like us trying to send images of like yeah, I've taken a picture of the model and this is the light painting. Okay, imagine the light painting placed on top of that bottle. It's just it's just way too many variables there for the client to just keep coming backwards and forwards backwards and forwards so yes i do like to take take control on the shot but at the same time it does need to be signed off the other thing that i think i'm very grateful for is that um, i feel like i've been doing it long enough now that when somebody reaches out to me they kind of know what they're getting right and they're not coming to me jake we would love some really nice white background high key work It'd be awesome like you know that's like do you know what i mean like that there's is, is less there's is less room room for error there or, or um arbitrary sort of questioning with regards to what they're getting like if, if they come into me they go and check i love what you've done on your i love this image on your website can we do that for for my brand yes yes we can so it, it there is my job is certainly easier from that regard because i'm very fortunate to have that kind of unified style and do you find that you'll get the inquiries where um, they haven't looked at your work before and don't know who you are as an artist, and they do want the uh, the uh, the white background and everything else? Is that something that you shy away from, or are you still going to take the job? I don't know whether that happens in this day and age, does it? I mean, like, it's just everybody, like, like, like it's just, I, I can't see how they would have got in touch with me without seeing my work. But to your point, let, let's say that they did see my work and they still said, would you do the, would you do the white background stuff? It, it's, look, you know, no, no. <laughs> it's not, um, I'm not that desperate for cash that, that I, you know, and, and I, I, that sounds so egotistical. It's like, oh my God, how arrogant is this guy? Like, I, 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 I know that, that sounds terrible. I get it. But at the same time, it, it, it's, it's not something that, that excites me. Like, like, you know, I like, we were just talking about brands and, you know, labels and all that sort of stuff. That's not something that is, oh yeah, cool. I work for Adidas. I can get to tell everybody on Facebook I work for Adidas. Like, that's not something that excites me. You know, if, this independent perfume brand comes to me and goes, Jake, I love this light painting stuff. We want to do that. I was like, okay, okay, yeah, I can, I can get on board with that. That's really, that sounds like a really exciting idea. Let's, let's, let's do it, right? As opposed to Adidas coming, yeah, let's, let's do a white, white background shoot. No, you know. And do you, um, do you consider yourself uh, more of a, a technical photographer rather than just see your pants? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Which is which is kind of weird because that's that's not really how I work. But I suppose if you've been doing it long enough, I suppose that 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 sort of technical side of it is is kind of instinctual, right? You know, it's the ten thousand hours thing. Um, you know, and I yeah, happens a lot when I'm doing workshops, right? I'll, and I'll be and I'll be setting stuff up, and in my mind, I'm explaining every single thing that I'm doing, and there's still be like oh jake what's this what's that what's this what's and it's just like yeah sorry yeah I, yeah i should have really yeah talked about that as well because like you because you're convinced that, you, that you're saying everything that, that that you think but there's so much that you're doing you know 
you know, even just moving the lie a little bit, you know, a few inches there is, oh, it's going to give me more, it's going to give me more drop off, which is going to give me shadow here. With that shadow, it means that I can bring in that blue fill light to give me more of a richer color in the, like that is happening instinctually and instantly. Now that is kind of, that's kind of a technical photographer with regards to being very accurate because I kind of need to be with color. I can't just turn on white lights. Any monkey can shoot that, you know, with color, you, you kind of need to be um, technically minded. So although I don't like the label, yes, I guess I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And and what strategies do you use to ensure um, a progressive aesthetic in your campaign in your campaigns and your work? So what do you what do you mean by that? Are you talking about the end goal or like my process from start to finish, or what do you what do you mean by that? Uh, so during the during the shoot, um, mm. how do you still make it feel like it's yours? I don't think we can escape that in all honesty. I don't think, I don't, I think if you've been doing anything for long enough, you cannot escape the just inherent human nature to do something in, in your, your particular way. Right. And that, that would, like you could make beans on toast every single day for the next year. And I guarantee you that by the end of that year, that would be a refined, you know, like, accurate within seconds of like that being done exactly the same way um just just because that's in our nature so this is my way of saying that a style is kind of inherent in all of us whether we like it or not if you've been doing it long enough um you know coming back to the youtube thing is it's, it's it's great to learn from youtube and try those things out but that's like if, if you're just if you're just copying parrot fashion what somebody is showing you that's not really you're not you know you're, you're not really growing as an artist to it to a certain extent you really need to just take the bare bones of what you're trying to achieve and then kind of do it in in your own way and i think that style or that method methodology of doing it is 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 always going to be um apparent in anybody who's been doing it for a long period of time so for me when i'm when i'm working on set throughout the uh, shoot day that, that that that's exactly what's what's happening um you know I, I, like i said you know i'm looking for i'm always looking for strong separation between subject and background i'm always looking for um the lighting on the you know the top of the face or the key light to be more dominant even if you know even if that means that we have to then use a recessive color underneath like there are triggers and things that i'm constantly looking for you know i'm, I'm looking for flowing lines through the image in terms of pose you know i'm, I'm you know i'm all of these kind of myriad of things that that I would consider make make a make a great image. I'm I'm trying to apply to my shots, and I think when you combine all of those things, that that's how you end up with this with this kind of personal style. And like I said, it is inevitable to try and avoid it. You hear people going, "Oh, I don't want a personal style. Although I don't want to be tied down to this one to this one thing." That's not what a style is, right? That's you know, that's just, it's, it's definitely not what a style is. A style is your way of doing something that you 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 cannot avoid yeah and uh given your strong background in pre-digital photography how has that influenced your approach to modern photography fundamentally i think it's the light light and shadow and the ability to read the light and you know when you shoot in film it's it is paramount that you that you're you are thinking about every single aspect of that frame before you press the button. And like we kind of joked about the uh, Fuji peel apart, you know, six six pounds a shot and all that sort of stuff. So when you you know when you when you shoot that that sort of film, right? You are I'm 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 in a different headspace before I press that button. And you can try and replicate that with digital to a certain extent. Okay, I really got to try and think about everything before before I press the button. But like there is like there is 
like there's no downside to you pressing that button. So it's very difficult to get into that headspace. When you're shooting film, you are like your you, your your brain is kind of wired differently. You're really trying to think about everything. Okay, let's just look at this. Let's, okay, let's make sure. Oh, let's bring that chin up a tiny bit. Or oh, uh, that cable is just coming out the back there. Just let me grab that a second. Um, you know, oh, it's it's a little bit dark in that corner. Like your brain is looking for things the that you know that you can't change, and it is. It is something that that I would encourage everybody to do it, it, it is to shoot film. Even if, if you've never shot film, I would strongly encourage you to do so because it does it does flip a switch in your brain that that really forces you to think about things differently. Really think about things. You know, if I, when I'm shooting a six quid an image, I'm I'm saying if you blink, you and I are no longer friends. Right? <laughs> so I'm going to count down when I press this. Okay, do not blink on one. You know, so like it's it's just basic stuff like that. You really just just getting everything just dialed in. So I think that's kind of one of the one of the most uh, fundamental things that, that that I have brought forward from the analog world is really looking at the scene, every sort of square inch of it, um, and some of that comes from the drawing classes that I used to do like 20 years ago, whatever it is. I mean, it would be, maybe it's like a life drawing class and it would be right today. You're going to spend two hours drawing that hand. You're just like, what? Like, what, 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 what am I going to do for two hours? It's like, are you kidding me? Like, it's no, what, like what? Um, and you know, you like, and you're analyzing the hand and how the light is falling on the knuckle and how the veins are forming and, and like, you know, how the fingers are overlapping and all that sort of stuff. And you're really just, you know, concentrating on these very minor elements and very, you know, tight elements and then kind of in, enlarging that. But like the flip is also true. It would be, okay, you have, you now have 10 seconds to draw this scene. And again, your brain goes, it's just no way I can, I can translate this, this human form to paper in 10 seconds. It's just no way, but you do. Right. And you know what these, what these exercises are doing. And I actually do this in my, uh, so in some of my workshops, I give all, all, all of the guys there guys and girls, you know, I give them pads and, and pencils. Some of them haven't you used a pencil in 20 years, but, you know, I go, look, the model's going to come out here and I'm going to get you to draw this model in 10 seconds. And like the brain is like, you know, people's like, I, I, I can't do that. You can do that. The brain starts to look at light and shadow alone, right? So you're just looking at these curves and shapes and, you, and your brain is able to translate that to um, paper. You do it like two or three times. You literally have to do it two or three times and you can see how quickly you improve. So what's happening there is your brain is reading the scene, is literally learning to read that scene better than it did before right? And it's taken us a minute, right? We've done this three or four times, 10 seconds a piece, and your brain is already able to process light and shadow more quickly than it did a minute ago. So like all of these things will, will help. But again, like we're just like, people aren't doing it at the moment. They're not really engaging because there's no downside to shooting at like 10,000 digital frames. It's just like, well, I mean, you may as well shoot it in 4k and just grab stills at the end. Like, what are we, what are we trying to achieve here? You know? So one of the things that I, I found with uh, shooting film uh, a lot is it actually brought my shot count down. And I bet the, it did a lot, yeah. There's, a, there's a, an on-running joke between me and some photography friends. They take 500 when I take five. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can see it, yeah, yeah. I mean, but that, that's it. Like, when we used to go out of a day with one roll of film, whether it be 24, 36 or whatever, I mean, that was that that was your shots, right? That, that was it. So, you know, you're really thinking thinking about each each image before you press the button. Yeah, I, I, I do think it is, it is a really useful exercise to do, yeah, yeah. And being proficient in modern uh, imaging software is crucial. Uh, how do you balance your in-camera approach with the use of software in post-production? Great question. Yeah, great question. And I think that uh, I think they go hand in hand. And although I've just spent all this time talking about how important it is to get it to get it right in camera, I think it's I think it's also important to get it right in camera with the end product in mind. So with with that knowledge, I know that. Um, I maybe need to shoot it slightly flatter in camera. So what that means is a little bit less contrast. So I want to make sure that I've got a lot of data in both my highlights and my shadows. And that may seem obvious to some of you, but 
being able to have the maximum amount of data in camera means that I'm able to do a lot more of that image in post pro. So, you know, any of us who have used Photoshop knows, look, if, if, if we increase the contrast in Photoshop, we simultaneously increase the saturation, right? Those two things are interlinked, you, like, you, like you can't separate them. So what that means is that if I'm shooting fairly flat in camera, in post, it means that I'm able to crank the contrast a lot more later on without clipping the data. Imagine if I was to shoot it fairly contrasty in camera, I can't increase the contrast too much in post because then I'll start to clip the data, right? So I am shooting with the post pro in mind. And again, all of that comes into the, like a workflow, just doing it over time. The more that you do it, you're going to be more accustomed to that workflow. And all of these things will, will help to give you this photographic style that, that people either want or don't want. But, you know, having a consistent workflow in Lightroom and Photoshop is going to be a huge signifier for like all your images on a portfolio, like on your website. If you've got a consistent workflow workflow from you know raw to screen, then it is going to mean that your images are going to look better um, and more cohesive with that with that workflow in mind. And uh, you conduct training on studio lighting internationally. Uh, what are some common misconceptions or challenges photographers face when it comes to lighting and how do you address them in your training? No, these, these are, yeah, these, yeah, these are good. I was, I was hoping for what's your favorite food and stuff, but no, okay. Um, uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, no, it's, it, it is, it, it, it is good. And, and obviously my, my speciality is, 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 is color, right? So there's certainly a lot of, a lot of misconceptions out there. Thanks to, thanks to 17 year old YouTubers. Um, but like some of them like double gels, right? That's, that, that, that's, that's a classic, right? So double gels. So, um, oh, if I use two gels, that's how I increase the color. Right. And I see people saying that all the time, absolute YouTube myth, uh, that, that, that does nothing. Um, the reason it does nothing is that you've got a color gel and white light, which is a rainbow, okay? So you have white light entering that color gel and that color gel is stripping out all the colors of the rainbow apart from, let's say red, right? You've got your red gel stripping out all the colors of the rainbow apart from red. So now once that rainbow has passed through that red gel, all that's left is red. We then go into another red gel. That's not doing anything, right? That's not adding red. That's, that's not how light works. It's just heating up extra stops. Exactly. Yeah. So what happens there is there's a is, is there's a misconception that all you've done is darken down that color because as you've said it, it's taking away more red because you've gone through a, an, another gel. So that's 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 where that misconception comes from is the darkening down of, of colors. And for the most part, and this is when, when I was when I was working in the studio, you'd get all the you know young guys and girls coming in, and that would that would be the first thing they would do is like, oh, we want more color. Let's give it more power. Right, rather, I, I rather understand. than stopping down. Exactly, yeah. I understand where that comes from. Like, you know, it, it, like it kind of makes sense. I want more color. Let's give it. Let's give it more juice. Yeah. Uh, but no, as that is, is actually the, the the opposite of, of of what you want to do is actually turn that down. And that tends to be where that where that rich, strong color comes from. So you don't you know you don't need double gels. Um, the other classic YouTube myth is uh, colored gels should be used against a gray background. Right, that gives you those those rich, strong colors. Again, absolutely not true at all. Um, like, think of gels like you're a watercolor artist, right? No watercolor artist is going to be using gray paper to paint their pictures on, right? So, um, and that's kind of the same thing. The reason why you see people saying about gray gray backgrounds with gels is again because it darkens down the image, it darkens down the color. Right, so that darkening down of that color again gives it the impression that you've that you've got more, uh, you know, you've, you've got more saturation there. It's just not true. Um, it's just bad. It's, it's just you badly managing the the exposure of that gelled light. You can get far cleaner, richer, stronger, more saturated colors always from using a white background. That's what those gels are designed for. Like try using a yellow gel on a gray background. I don't know who started this myth, but like. No, it's <laughs> please stop. 
And how do you balance your, your roles as a, a photographer, trainer, and writer for Lightbook? Um, do they inform, complement each other in any specific ways? Um, I think I'm always, you know, I think as an as an artist, you you are working twenty four seven, and um, that is a blessing and a curse, right? And I I can't step away from it, you know. I'll, I'll you know, I'm in a cafe and there's you know there's, there's light coming through the glass glass blocks you know we were in la there and this is exactly what was happening i was sat there just you know with, with my wife and the light was like streaming in through these glass blocks and she's like what are you like are you even listening to me i was like have you seen that light coming through those glass blocks you see how it looks like dappled you know light from trees and all that sort of stuff like and then i was like okay cool right now i need to go home and just buy a bunch of glass blocks and just create this dappled light effect and that sort of thing um I'm in mean, a clothing shop and they've got this LED screen and the way and the way that the the LEDs are, are like mixing the colors and now I'm just like stood in front of this like some crazy person. So yeah, like you're always working in 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 my opinion, like you know, if um if you're passionate about what you do then you're always working and you're always looking for new ideas and new ways to uh adapt lighting and that sort of stuff. I am not somebody that could that could do just the same lighting setup day in day out i couldn't do it i you know i wouldn't do it yeah i, I think i'd rather work in mcdonald's you know it, it, it that doesn't engage me at all so i'm always thinking about how can i do something new and different and engaging with with light to you know to make something cool right like when i'm trying to get somebody's attention we see thousands of images a day how do i get them to stop you know um so that's what i'm always thinking about and then that those will then just be banked or whatever and then i'll just apply them to the next photo shoot to the next article to the next training or that sort of thing so yes i think i think everything everything comes from the from from the same pool in in, in terms of you know knowledge it, it, it's 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 the same thing to me yeah i, I do have a, a bit of a, a kindred in terms of the uh, the learning experience on that one uh, my thing always used to be uh going into uh, usually sainsbury's and they'd have the the, the full <laughs> the full um picture of their their clothing brand and oh, yeah, I, yeah. I would walk up to it and be looking for the catch lights to see how they've looked <laughs> yeah but... that's it yeah in um like boots and stuff like like the, the makeup aisle where they've just got massive images of people's faces and you're just like looking at the eyeballs and stuff yeah yeah just yeah. just to learn the lighting <laughs> yeah that's true that's true <laughs> Um, so what advice would you give to uh, aspiring photographers, especially looking those looking to establish themselves in the industry and and work with the sort of clients that you've worked with? Um, as soon as I've given this advice, it's completely out of date. Like that's just the world that we live in now. Um, you know, and it's it is it is an interesting time. You know, you think about kids starting school today like how many of them are going to be able to do a job that they're training for like like i, I should think 80 percent of the jobs haven't been invented that, that those kids are going to do so i think it is very difficult to give advice in the current market but um i think you've got to understand as to what what you want to get from it right do you just want to be able to stand there at a dinner party and say look i'm a photographer that's that that's my job is that because and, and you know everybody's different and i i have met people that really that's all they want to do. They may be driving around all day for photographing oil refineries for an internal newsletter, but they get to say that they're they're a photographer. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hating on that. Whatever floats your boat. So either that, do you want to make? Look, I just want to make loads of money um, from this. Uh, I just want to meet all the pretty girls. I just want to be surrounded in the fashion industry. Um, for me, it's it's kind of. I, 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 I need to do this. I, I have these ideas in my head that, that if I wasn't doing, if, if it wasn't my job, I would still be doing it and, and, and getting getting those those images out of my head in terms of, oh, that's a cool idea. I want to try that. Um, so I think it's difficult. You know, do you want, do you, do you just want to be famous on YouTube? Do you want to make money from um, YouTube money? Do you want to make, you know, money from um, adverts and that sort of thing? There's so many ways that you can make money in our industry now. And, and, and I think that, you know, years ago, it was like, oh, you know, it was easier years ago, you know, um, 
you, you, you were a postcode shooter, you had a camera, you did, you, know, you stood up there and took pictures. And that was really the only way that you made money with a camera back then. You know, I photographed like this ancient book in the Oxford University Press, like in an underground air sealed vault. Like that, nobody's using a photographer today, I can assure you, right? Somebody's just knocking that out on their phone. Are you kidding me? Right? So like, all those, all those kind of weird jobs have, are kind of gone now, but, um, there are so many different ways to make money from imagery now. And I think that for me, I'm kind of happy with the middle ground that I've struck in the, I'm able to make money from taking images for clients. I'm also able to make money from, you know, training people and educating people, which is, which is what I absolutely love, love doing. It's not just something that, that oh, I, I have to do it to kind of, um, make ends meet is like some of the, some of the best gigs that, that I do mainly because it's just like super creative and people are super keen to be there. And I love seeing people, you know, taking images and them just being like super pumped for that. So that's amazing. Like getting really excited for it. Like there's, that is such, such, such a great feeling. Um, bottom line is you just got to shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. And then I think you just got to shoot some more. Like that is that is the bottom line, really. It's it's great that there is so much knowledge out there, um, you know. And it's the old adage of you know a hundred travel books isn't worth one one real journey. And and I think that that's the case. Like just keep shooting, shooting, shooting. And I mean, you know, you've got to be doing shoots at the weekend if if you're trying to do this and you've got a full time job, you've got to be doing you know two three shoots on the weekend every weekend. You just got to be trying new ideas, seeing what you like, um, seeing what you don't like. That's important. Like don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't forget that you do not need to share everything. Right? I see so many so many young people being afraid to make mistakes to try new ideas because oh oh it's cool. I don't know. I don't know. I can pull that. Off. Like it's fine to make mistakes. Remember, you know, like mistakes are the are the seeds of creativity. That's sounds cheesy as all hell but in reality that's what it is if you make a mistake like the human condition is to make a change from that mistake to get a new result and that change is creativity right that very notion of changing what you've done from previously that is creativity and that is what is going to keep you moving forward and trying new ideas and and uh, you know creating the work that you want to create but you can only find what that work is by shooting 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 find out finding out what you like is just as important as finding out what you don't like yeah. So uh, coming towards the, the end of the uh, interview now, um, I always ask everybody, um, is there anybody in particular that sort of inspires you? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that, 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 that is an interesting one. And um, yeah, I think when I was, when I was growing up, it was Nick Knight. It was, was just, um, was at the forefront like what that what that guy did you know very very famous fashion photographer here in the uk uh i mean you know he still he still still does stuff today he's more doing stuff with nfts now but i'll forgive him um but you know he he his his work back then was just light years ahead of his time in in terms of the color work that that he was doing was totally out there. Um, and it was just on film as well. It was just mind blowing. So the work that he was doing was just incredible to me, just absolutely. And just every single shoot that he did was just nuts compared to the previous one. Ned of Kander is another one here in the UK as well. Um, huge inspiration in terms of creativity with some of the slightly longer exposure work that he was doing and just not given a shit about the fact that he would take a blurry as all hell picture of like David Beckham in his prime. Like what a legend, right? Um, that's like, I love, I love people that are just un, unapologetic about their style, right? This is, you know, he's, he's got David Beckham at the time, which is arguably one of the most famous people on the planet. And it's just like this blurry, blurry blob. And it's like, what a legend. Um, so I think that, you know, people like that who are, who are very bold with the style and just want to produce what they want to produce regardless of who it's going to offend um i think is yeah awesome i think it's great um today uh, this is not me being cocky but no I, I i do not follow uh photographers today i'll i'm more drawn to um cinema like people like david fincher is an absolute legend in terms of the work that he's doing and sure you could you, you could arguably go well surely that's the dp or cinematographer and yeah you could you could argue that but i think david fincher's work is is so um 
so synonymous across all of his, his his movies that I'm pretty sure that he he he's the one um, calling the uh, shots on that. Um, so yeah, David Fincher. I mean, even some of the uh, Tony Scott. I don't, you know, he's um, passed now, but some of the stuff that, that he did was was really cool in terms of like graphics. I think it would have to be a Denny Villeneuve for me. Yeah, no, I mean he's good. Yeah, absolutely, he's good. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, I think uh, Michael Mann is another good one. Michael Michael Bay gets 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 a lot of shit for his work, but I think what he does with color is. Um, kind of a little bit overlooked i know it's like cheesy but he has to he has to work with very fast paced action and the way that he is allowing your brain to process that very fast paced action is usually to do with 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 strong contrasting colors and that can come across as a little bit cheesy but it, it it's a very clever technique to deliver us visual data in a very short space of time um so i think he gets he he gets a lot of flack, but I think a lot of the stuff that he does is actually pretty, pretty clever with um, light and color as well. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of my inspiration also comes from anime and manga. So a lot of the very vibrant uh, colors that you'll see in my work is is, is often inspired from Japanese anime, uh, just because they're able to do incredible things with color in a in a very clever way because you're already. Like your brain is already being asked to dispel belief and they push that like to the absolute limit like akira is a great great example of that you've got like bright purples and bright like green concrete purple just seats and like it's just bizarre color but because your brain is already being um sort of you know lulled into this make-believe world you don't get kicked out of it um but like the like the work that they do with color and things like that is nuts yeah so um we're at the end um whereabouts can people find you uh everything's from jkxphotography.com so that's like everything leads from there i'm on instagram under the similar name and my um facebook page the facebook page is 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 actually a great place if you if you want to chat and ask questions to me i know it's i know it seems like a dated place now but i prefer facebook as a way to actually communicate with people as opposed to just eight emojis job done on on instagram like that's cool but i, I think that you know I, I, I live stream on facebook every other tuesday and we have a good a good crowd in there getting getting nerdy about gear and lighting and photoshop and that sort of stuff so if, if, you, if you wanted to um hang out and ask questions that that, that would be the place yeah jkx photography facebook page the uh, the link will be in the description for the show and also on the uh, accompanying article as well. So from me, I want to say thank you for taking the time to uh, to come and uh, have a, a chat on the uh, on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate uh, it. I've, yeah. I've enjoyed the conversation. Definitely learned some stuff as well. It's just me me ranting, but I appreciate you giving a conversation. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So uh, that leads me to say, it's always easier if you put the effort in. This is The Photography Junkie.